So next, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Audrey Brumbach. She is a child neurologist in the UT Health Austin Pediatric Neurosciences at Dell Children's and an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Dell Medical School. Uh, she earned her medical degree and her doctorate in neuroscience from the University of Colorado, and then went on to complete her residency in child neurology at the University of California in San Francisco. Um, she is a physician scientist and a prolific researcher and writer. Um, she's the recipient of numerous awards and honors, and a nationally recon recognized expert in the clinical assessment and management of autism spectrum disorders. Uh, her research focuses on mapping brain circuits to treat symptoms of autism, using innovative genetic approaches to develop personalized therapies for people with autism, and increasing equity in autism healthcare delivery. Her work is currently funded by, the, by grants from the National Institutes of Mental Health and the American Brain Foundation. She will talk to us about a practical approach to autism for primary care practitioners. Thanks, Louisa. I've never done this before, but I feel like it's the right time. Everybody who wants to stand up and get the wiggles out. <laughs> I get these uh, alerts on my uh, watch. It's time to stand up every hour, and I dismiss. <laughs> so I figured let's let's uh, uh, have a healthy um, start to our uh, conversation here. So, um, you know. This is such a vast topic, and so I'm going to give you a little amuse-bouche of um, some parts of autism care that I think are really important. Um, and then I think, you know, I, I really want to know what are your burning questions and how can I help you answer those um, to the best of my ability. Okay, so um, I have no disclosures. All right, so our learning objectives for today I'm going to go through the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for autism, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, sort of more uh, character, more sort of stereotypical presentations as well as more subtle presentations. We'll talk about the treatments that we can offer, and then um, ways that we can understand the etiology for uh, a person's autism. Okay, so um, the basic idea um, of how we understand autism right now is that uh, it's a behaviorally based uh, condition. We don't have any biomarkers, we don't have any blood tests for autism. And so the way that we diagnose this is based on report from families and reports from the person themselves. The, um, the, the, uh, sorry, the, um, symptoms fall into two major categories. The first is atypical social communication, and the second is focused interests and repetitive behaviors. That category also includes sensory differences. I pull it out as sort of a third part of the diagnostic criteria because I think that it sort of deserves its own uh, uh, elevation to a major uh, component of this uh, disorder that right now is sort of subsumed within this uh, focused interest in repetitive behaviors uh, category. So like the other neurodevelopmental disorders that we've heard about, like ADHD, you know, this is one that starts early in life. Um, and it's not better explained by other things like uh, global developmental delay or intellectual disability or ADHD. I often have kids who come in, they're super hyperactive, and I can't tell how much of what I'm seeing is their hyperactivity versus whether they're autistic. And so I treat the ADHD, and then I see what's left. And then I can do my autism evaluation. So I think um, one thing that I, I do want to say at the outset here, um, before talking about sort of the symptoms of autism, is that there's a growing movement towards uh, accepting neurodiversity uh, in our society. Uh, autism is uh, called autism spectrum disorder. Um, and currently on the DSM, under DSM-5 criteria, that encompasses people who used to be called Asperger's, with people who are, have more profound uh, challenges. And so um, in terms of neurodiversity, much of this is aimed towards the people that used to, would have, that are more of the Asperger's type of autism. Um, the 
challenge that, that they see in how we talk about autism is that it's all negative. Uh, and for a person with autism, uh, it may not be that, uh, you know, they don't see themselves as having uh, a disorder or having uh, a condition. It's that the neurotypical people just don't understand them. And they don't understand us. Um, so as an example, you know, we'll talk about the diagnostic criteria and you know one of the things we'll talk about is you know the kid who lines up their cars and you know plays with their toys in, a, in an atypical way well from that kid's perspective they're just playing with their toys and it might not make sense to you but it makes sense to them similarly with dealing with changes in routine cognitive flexibility you know for this kid in the picture here you know he, why is this kid freaking out because he's being handed a red cup instead of a green cup? But for that kid, he was, had this expectation that he was going to get a green cup, and he just wants the world to make sense to him. So as we talk um, through the next several slides about autism symptoms, I do just want to, um, to sort of make this part of the conversation um, that our our, speaking as a non-autistic person, um, uh, conceptualization of what a disorder is, is evolving. Um, and it's part of sort of a broader conversation about neurodiversity. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through these two major categories of uh, autism symptoms that characterize the DSM-5 criteria. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about each one of these. And we'll talk about each symptom category from the very stereotypical to the more subtle presentations, okay? So starting with uh, the first category of social communication, when we think about social emotional reciprocity and difficulties with that, you know, we sort of think of the stereotypical person with autism as having no empathy or being disengaged. Well, in reality, um, for a more subtle presentation, it might be that it's just hard for this person to engage in small talk or share their feelings. And things are easier when there's an activity and they don't have to engage in back and forth conversation. So this is why you know, Dungeons and Dragons is very popular, is that you, you know, it allows you to have that, uh, that interpersonal interaction without um, needing to have the effort of doing a back and forth conversation. In terms of nonverbal communication, we might think of somebody who doesn't make eye contact, who has a flat affect, who's not pointing. In more subtle versions of autism, this can be somebody who just makes eye contact, but they just say it's not natural for them. They have to work at it. It's something they've always had to think about doing. This is a person who might have challenges with understanding facial expressions or sarcasm. They might always feel like they're the butt of the joke because people are making sarcastic comments and they think that they're being serious. This might be somebody who doesn't understand the difference between teasing and bullying and uh, might think that you know everybody's their best friend, even the kids that are you know, bullying them at school. Or it might be that um, they think that everybody is bullying them and they can't quite tell that, you know, some gentle ribbing is, is okay. Other subtle ways that nonverbal communication um, can, can be different in people with autism is unusual prosody. So this might be somebody who has a more robotic voice, um, let more monotone, somebody who speaks really loudly, kind of whatever the situation. And then when we see kids who are pointing um, to get their needs met, but not to point out something that they think is cool. So, um, you know, parents will say, sure, you know, he points, you know, at what he wants in the uh, cabinet. But I ask, well, is he pointing at, like, the airplane in the sky? Is he, is he going, you know, airplane and doing it in a way that he's really checking to make sure that you're actually looking. It's not just him pointing because that's how he 
looks at things is by pointing. He's really doing it to communicate. We think stereotypically about people with autism. They don't have friends. They don't want friends. And for more subtle presentations of autism, it can be that the person just gravitates towards older or younger kids. They might always want to play a defined role, like the, being the teacher or the helper. In girls, this can be uh, kids that are described as being bossy. When they are on the playground, it's their way or the highway. And if the kid, other kids aren't going to play the way they want to, then they won't play. And People can have friend groups. It just might be that those friends are people that are more like family, people that have known them since they were little, people that you know, accept them for who they are, just like a family member would. Let's talk about stereotypies. So the stereotypical idea of a person with autism is somebody who has um, repetitive language. They're parroting what they're hearing. Uh, they might rock their body, spin around, flap their hands, line up objects. In a more subtle presentation, this can be somebody that I would say has an eye for detail. Uh, I ask parents, you know, do you think that he's going to be a, uh, do you think he's going to be an engineer? Um, somebody who's really, you know, really, yeah, has that eye for detail. Somebody who's highly organized, and you know, it really bothers them if things are disorganized. In terms of doing things repetitively, this can be reading the same book or watching the same movie over and over again. And then in terms of the motor manifestation, so the motor stereotypies that we think of, instead of major movements like rocking your body or flapping your hands, it can be something as simple as picking at your cuticles repetitively. In terms of cognitive flexibility, we think of somebody who needs rigid routines, is intolerant to change, and maybe has some odd rituals. For a more subtle presentation, this can be somebody who's a perfectionist. They might have anxiety related to changes or transitions, but they're able to do them. It's just that it causes a real um, inner stress. And this is somebody who might be a really strict rule follower. And um, you know, when you're learning to drive, well, you know, the speed limit is 35 miles per hour, so I cannot go 36 miles per hour. In terms of interests, we think of you know the kid who's memorized the train schedule from Paris in 1896. For more subtle presentations of autism, these can be sort of more normal topics where you know, well, gosh, aren't all girls into horses? Um, isn't everybody into Taylor Swift? And so it can be on sort of typical topics. Um, it's just that the intensity of the of the interest is it what is what sets them apart. In terms of sensory, we think of a stereotypical child with autism watching fans spin, spinning the wheels on the toy car. Somebody who has uh, sensory aversions doesn't want to be touched. Well, in a subtle version of autism, this can be somebody who has a high pain threshold. They might trip and fall and skin their knee and just get up and keep running. There's no, uh, they, they don't, you know, request comfort, uh, comforting from their parent. This might be somebody who has differences in how they uh, perceive temperature, somebody who's wearing shorts year round in Chicago or wearing, you know, long sleeve, you know, sweatpants and sweatshirts in, in Texas. This might be, um, you know, instead of lining up your cars, it might be that, you know, just when you're kind of stopped at a stop sign or when you're just in your regular life, you kind of just like how things line up. And you might move your head in such a way that it just, things are parallel. You might look at things kind of out of the corner of your eye or like to look at things really up close. These are kids who can be really picky eaters. And um, for sensory seeking behaviors, I like to ask, you know, is your child somebody who likes to explore the world through their fingertips? Somebody who really loves feeling textures? And so um, 
we've gone through and now talked about sort of the, what I see as the spectrum of autism symptoms and how we can have the stereotypical types of symptoms that we see in movies, um, but also the more subtle presentations. And <clears throat> for these people with, uh, with uh, more subtle presentations, those are often women. And so what I find is that we have girls that are flying under the radar. They may be experiencing autism symptoms, but they're doing a really good job of hiding it. And so I will often have a parent come in um, with their child and we'll have a conversation about symptoms. I'll say, mom, dad, you know, you answer, child answer, I just wanna know whatever anybody has to say, I wanna know what everybody thinks. And I'll go through and I'll ask, you know, how do you feel about eye contact? You know, is small talk hard for you? You know, who, who is your friend group? Um, you know, how, how do you do with changes in routine? And, you know, do you feel like you experience the world differently in terms of sensation? And the mom will be like, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. And the kid will be like, actually, mom, that's always been an issue for me. And it's like they're coming out to their parent as being neurodiverse uh, in my clinic. And it's really because they're really good at masking. They're really good at blending in. Um, but it takes every molecule of ATP that they have in order to do that. And so what we often see is that these girls will blend in at school. The teachers don't see any issues. They're doing great. They make good grades. They follow the rules. They seem to, you know, they've got a friend group, um, the friends that they've had since preschool. The teachers don't see any issues. But then the girls come home, and it, they just melt down. They have used every bit of energy they have at school to keep it together and act neurotypical. And they come home and fall apart. So my challenge for you is when you are in your clinic and you see a person who has maybe collected some diagnoses of anxiety and ADHD, perhaps, and those things have been treated, but there's still something going on. The person still doesn't feel right. Press the pause button and think, could this person have undiagnosed autism? For somebody who's, oh I, my goodness, this pause still button, I don't know how to stop that. <laughs> it's sort of hilarious. Um, thank you to whoever put that into my uh, presentation. Um, you see meltdowns in somebody who's a preteen or a teenager. Somebody who is experiencing school trouble but they don't qualify for an IEP under you know, intellectual disability. The school can tell there's something going on, but they can't quite put their finger on it. And then, especially teenagers who are starting to uh, display signs of what people think are personality disorders, press the pause button and ask, could this person have undiagnosed autism? And remember that you know, many of these families will have had prior evaluations in their lives, and some doctor has told them, your child doesn't have autism. And they will often have been told that because they make eye contact, because they have a friend group. There are all these, you know, things that we think about as stereotypical autism, and somehow those are, you know, automatic eliminators <laughs> of the diagnosis. And that's just not the case. And so in addition to symptoms being not attributed to autism um, because they're mild or subtle, things might, you know, things get more complex as you get older. You know, in elementary school, having a friend group, I'm gonna just fast forward that so it's not playing anymore. Um, you know, in in elementary school, having a friend group is, you know, you ask somebody if they want to play, and then you go play, and now you have a friend. And in middle school, that all changes. And now, oh my god, we've got to sit here and have a conversation and talk about our feelings, and I have to figure out who the mean girls are and how to, you know. It's, we all know 
you know, middle school dynamics. And so you can imagine how somebody did okay in elementary school, they hit middle school and things fall apart. Okay, so uh, in the last couple of minutes, um, I wanna talk about, so who can make a diagnosis of autism? So you can. Everybody here in this room who practices medicine can make a DSM-5 diagnosis of autism. I know, understand that that is challenging because it feels like you're breaking bad news. It feels like you're telling somebody, you know, you're stamping this person for life with this uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. But I would say, you know, if, and the other thing is that people want to be 100% sure. People don't want to give that diagnosis unless they're like 1,000% sure. And so what I'll say is, if you as a primary care provider think that somebody's autistic, they probably are. I have never had somebody refer a patient to me where the primary care provider thought they were autistic and I didn't. That has never happened. People are so shy and loath to provide this diagnosis that if you think it's true, it probably is. And so you can make the diagnosis based on DSM-5 criteria. You can provide that that diagnostic clarity to the family. If you want them to get ABA, <laughs> which we can talk about in uh, the Q&A, the insurance companies are asking for standardized assessments. And we can talk about that afterwards. And I can even like do a workshop on that if that would be helpful for people. Um, so what can you do as the PCP? You can get them their hearing tested, send them to speech therapy. Occupational therapy is great for general problem solving as well as sensory uh, regulation. Get them plugged in with special education. Make sure that the school is testing them for autism. Um, I'll tell you about a couple of community supports that I really love here in Austin. ABA, um, we can talk about later. And then optimizing sleep. I would ask everybody about sleep. That is just such a pervasive challenge for all of our families. And, uh, and if you don't ask about it, you won't be able to treat it. And so um, optimizing sleep is really um, key. We have a fantastic sleep medicine program here um, at Dell Children's, and I refer everybody to them. And I would encourage you to do so too. They're really fabulous. Okay, so we talked about Vela a little bit before. Um, this is a community uh, nonprofit organization uh, whose motto is through the parrot for the child. Um, the idea is to provide support to families to understand their children's uh, neurodevelopmental conditions and to um, provide support for families. And then um, through the UT Speech and Hearing Center, there's a grant-funded program, so it's free for families, um, called Project Skills. And this is for uh, anybody in Texas uh, who wants uh, their child, typically under age eight, to uh, enhance their social communication. And so the, the program basically kind of teaches ABA type uh, techniques to families to engage the child and get them um, to be more, um, uh, to, to sort of have them play with others um, as opposed to just playing by themselves. Okay, uh, two more slides. First, uh, vaccines do not cause autism. What does? It's mostly genetics. And so as a uh, child neurologist, I do first line uh, diagnostics, which is to do a chromosomal microarray. Uh, that's recommended by all of the, org all of the professional organizations. Um, and in patients who have um, insurance, I will often get an exome, a whole exome sequencing. Um, so that is pretty complex and something that I wouldn't expect most primary care, pro care providers to do. But what you can do is give them this website, Spark for Autism. So this is a free genetic testing study um, that uh, 
is, you know, it's not 23andMe, it's like, you know, a real research study. Um, you know, I feel very confident having people send their, um, their, you know, specimens here. They register on the portal, they get sent some kits, they send in some saliva samples, and then they're plugged into this network. And uh, Spark has a list of genes that, you know, are the high, prob are the, are the high confidence autism genes. Um, and if they identify uh, a change in one of those genes in your patient, they will notify the patient. And then you can do some targeted testing for that gene or send them to me. Okay, so today we've talked about diagnostic criteria for autism and how it can range from the very stereotypical to the very subtle. We've talked about supports that we can provide for families and about how we can get genetic testing. All right, I'll take questions now. Thank you. I have a true story that's actually unfolding as we speak, so I would like to hear your comments about that. So I had an 11-month-old patient, or... Can you hold it down? Or let's say that he was 11 months old when I diagnosed him. But I didn't diagnose him because I diagnosed autism. I diagnosed him because of lack of resources anywhere else. So I did all the referrals I was supposed to. In the meantime, the mother and the child went to Kerala, which is in southern India. Day three, you know, at and will take us wherever we want to go. They actually showed me the improvement in the child. Now, my question is that if we are emphasizing so much early diagnosis, early treatment, they have no resources. You know, these are educated parents. Both the parents have insurance. Child has double coverage. Money is not a problem. They have no appointment anywhere till the child is 18 months. They have all the appointments lined up for when the child comes back. But why do we say one thing yet do another? Say. Why do we say it's so important to diagnose early when, in reality, we don't have medical treatments for autism and you know, we're relying on community resources that are scant? Um, I think that's the, the just question. So um, I think, first of all, I think, I think one of the most important reasons to diagnose a child with autism is so that the family can reframe all of what they're seeing um, I have a lot of families where the extended family thinks that the mom just isn't disciplining the child enough. And, you know, if only they, you know, did what the, they would do to discipline the child, the child would, you know, be neurotypical. And so that's, you know, I have a lot of families like that where just being able to educate the extended family about, you know, this is just how this person's brain is wired up. It's just wired up differently. And so you can't expect them to behave in a typical way. Second, I think that um, having these targeted types of therapies where we're teaching parents how to best interact with their child to sort of bring them out of their shell. Um, and you know, how can a parent you know, engage in the child's play with them in an effective way? That is also worth its weight in gold. We want to make sure that you know, we're not changing the child's personality, but rather we're opening up the child to being able to experience learning opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have if they were off on their own, not engaged with others. Um, and then third, I think that we are in a very exciting time for medical uh, research and treatments. Over the past 10 years, we've made huge discoveries in the genetics of autism and we are currently working to provide gene therapies, you know, personalized medical therapies to people with specific genetic disorders. And about a quarter of people with autism do have something on their clinical genetic testing that we think is causing their, them to have autism. And you're gonna miss out on that opportunity if you're not plugged into the family 
to the family group. Every genetic disorder at this point has its own family foundation that is corralling the patients so that they can participate in research. And if you don't have that genetic diagnosis, you're not going to be part of that. Um, I will say that, uh, well, OK, I'll stop there. Yeah. Uh, great talk. So we do have a um, comment slash question in the chat. Uh, we often get a pushback from insurance companies for the diagnosis and approval of ABA. How do we go about with that? Oh, brother. So this is evolving. So um, when I first started here in 2017, um, I was able to refer for ABA without needing to go through that many hoops. Um, of course, it was only available for people with insurance at the time. Um, and so that was only a tiny fraction of my patient population. Now, um, Medicaid is paying for uh, ABA in Texas. Um, but like most Medicaid uh, providers, there aren't that many of them, and it's a big deal to be, you know, to have to go through the hoops that the providers have to go through. Um, and on the insurance side, both from the, the public insurance and the private insurance, um, there's been a big push to um, decrease access to these therapies by making providers jump through so many hoops. So um, I think that one uh, hoop that they ask you to jump through is to provide a DSM-5 diagnosis. And I'm actually happy to provide my, you know, the, the wording that I use um, in my notes that is, you know, the, the wording that is now, you know, appropriate for providing the insurance companies what they need. Um, but basically, providing the reasons why the person's autistic, which is listing out the DSM-5 criteria that they meet, saying that it's not because they're intellectually disabled, it's not because they've had, um, you know, early life trauma. Um, so that's all good. Um, you can do that, but then the insurance companies are now asking for a standardized uh, assessment. So uh, in our practice, we use the, the CARS-2. The issue is that this is a proprietary uh, assessment. It's a checklist of symptoms that you rate, sort of like the Vanderbilt for autism. But these, all of these uh, assessment tools you have to pay for them. <laughs> you can bill for them. And so I think that's probably an underperformed uh, test or you know, assessment tool. Um, but it's because, I mean, who's trained on how to do that? <laughs> you know, and who who's, you know, what practice is gonna know to buy, you know, these these standardized assessments. So this is actually part of my research program, is to bring open access, free, standardized assessment tools uh, into practice so that everybody <laughs> can have access to these standardized assessments that the insurance companies are requiring. And to provide confidence to the primary care providers that, yeah, this person is autistic. I feel confident now that I've, you know, gone through this standardized questionnaire and, you know, ra rated this person. I feel confident in giving that diagnosis myself. Great. Um, let's talk about the proprietary aspect of that. I have some ideas for you. Um, but okay. So a few other questions. Do you use a specific company for genetic testing and getting covered as a PCP? Uh, am I allowed to talk about this with, like, CME stuff? I don't want to be seen as like, you know. Are you getting any funding for it? No, no, okay, no. Then you right, can, right, right. Okay. You can so, uh, so um, we currently use uh, GeneDX. So it used to be that um, you had to get a blood sample to do genetic testing, which you know, who, who's going to do that? Um, and so now you can do it with a cheek swab. 
And it's something that our nurses do in the office. It's something your nurses could probably do in the office. It's really just like brushing the kid's teeth with a, cheek, with a Q tip in their cheek. Um, and every child who's on Medicaid uh, is eligible for a chromosomal microarray uh, for zero dollars out of pocket to the family. And so everybody in Texas who has uh, an autism diagnosis should get a chromosomal microarray. Um, so GeneDx can send you those kits and, uh, and then you can just mail them in. Um, I think they make it pretty easy. Um, if the patient has insurance and it's covered by their insurance, GeneDx will also on the same sample do a whole exome sequencing. Chromosomal microarray is looking for duplications and deletions. So little parts of the DNA where it's been copied and pasted, so there's two pieces, or where there's a little piece that's been deleted. The exome sequencing is looking at just the, the recipes for, uh, for life and asking, are there any misspellings in any of those words that make up those recipes? So they're complementary testing. That's great. Uh, another question. Thank you for this thoughtful presentation and res resource uh, recommendations. For younger children with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder and aggressive behavior uh, who are in therapy, who the PCP feels may benefit from a medication management for the aggression, what recommendations do you have for starting medication? Yeah. Okay, so, and I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to curbside about all this stuff too. Like, this is, the, these are, you know, major issues that you guys are trying to manage in your primary care practice. Um, and so I'm happy to just, you know, give separate talks about medication management as well and, you know, talk offline. Um, so <clears throat> my, this isn't going to feel like a good answer to the question, but my first uh uh, level of investigation and treatment for a child who's got uh, challenging behaviors, externalizing behaviors, is to make sure that they're sleeping at night and that they don't have sleep apnea. If a child is snoring, it means they're not moving air appropriately and they need to see the sleep medicine doctors. Um, even if they're not, if you have bedtime insomnia, wake up in the middle of the night, that kid needs a sleep medicine specialist. Um, refer them. Um, and then, you know, what are all the things that can make a kid feel crummy that might make them be acting out if they're not able to, to really c even identify or communicate what they're experiencing? And so I often send these kids back to you guys and say, you know, let's check their teeth, let's check their ears, check their throat, make sure they're not constipated. Um, you know, let's just make sure that their general health is okay um, so that we can kind of eliminate that from the equation and optimize the child's um, well-being. I will say one thing I think that is underdiagnosed in people with autism and kids with neurodevelopmental disorders is migraine. Migraine is super common in the population. It doesn't necessarily manifest as headache. It can just manifest as feeling crummy. And if you have a child who's not able to really identify how they're feeling or express how they're feeling, they might be experiencing migraine and we just don't know it. So um, I would have a low threshold for doing a trial of uh, naproxen uh, to see, you know, if we give a, a headache treatment or an anti-inflammatory treatment, does that make the kid feel better? We can also talk about other medications, risperidone, et cetera. Um, but I think that's probably outside the scope of what we're able to, to cover today. <laughs>